It's okay, Kenny. We all make mistakes. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's rare for Kenny, but it happens. As rare as Blake's audio working, so <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I actually requested a formal apology from everybody in the chat that said I was most likely the one who caused it. So uh, <laughs> the episode's not over yet, Blake. Yeah, yeah g- give it time. Night is young. Night is young. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of Bourbon bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. Well, we're back and it's another installment of the Bourbon Community Roundtable, but this time still digging deep into the psychology realm. Now, I posed this question a few weeks ago to our Patreon community to get some initial feedback. And I asked them, when is it enough? Not enough of buying bourbon. I'm completely cool with that. Please keep doing that. But at what point... Do you have enough of the same thing? It's pretty common to see people talking and chasing about the same bottles everywhere. But every day, there's a load of comments on every picture of Blanton's when I'm scrolling in my Facebook newsfeed. Or there's a line outside of a store with people waiting for everyday items like Eagle Rare or W.L. Weller. And now we're getting to the point where I'm seeing pictures with nothing except one type of bottle lined up 10 deep on the shelf. And it's all the same thing. So. I really want to ask, if you see an Eagle Rare, why do you grab it? Why do you have to grab it? You've had it plenty of times. Why do you continue to pull it off the shelf instead of thinking, well, maybe I should put my resources into something different? So when is it enough? Are you looking for value? Are you afraid of change and you just know it's safe? Or perhaps maybe you're just looking for status. I want to go deep once again to understand more about the bourbon buyer mentality. Well, enjoy this week's episode. I know you're going to love it. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Aaron, who writes me on fredminnick.com. I recently went to Dublin and partook in some distillery tours. I was not shocked on how many distilleries use X bourbon barrels, but I was surprised on the distilleries hanging their hats on how old they are. This got to me thinking. Some of these distillers have been open since the 1700s, well before I assume we began exporting barrels. What did they use before we started exporting? When did we start exporting? Have Irish whiskey and scotches that use ex bourbon barrels drastically changed in flavor over time until these barrels become available? Well, this is such a complex uh, discussion that there's a film coming out on this that I was a part of, and I I can't really get into everything here because that would be one big long above the char. But Aaron, I will tell you that if you go around in those places, you can tell there's not a lot of trees left around. Uh, But historically, they got a lot of uh, barrels from uh, Spain and Portugal. But the modern movement of selling barrels over there really begins in the 1930s and especially after World War II. So uh, when in the early 1930s, it becomes federal law that bourbon must go into a new charred oak container. The Cooperage Lobby got that on the federal code and it became uh, a mainstay for all of whiskey makers. And of course, the Irish, Scotch, Canadian whiskey makers, they were not uh, held to the same cooperage standard, they could use basically whatever barrel they wanted, and they chose to buy up a lot of um, used uh, bourbon barrels. Now, the market the market for sherry ebbs and flows in this time. I think if you were really to, to press, if you really to press a lot of those distillers in that 1940s to 1960s time frame, I think they would tell you they would prefer sherry barrels, but bourbon barrels were so much cheaper. And so that was a big, big reason why it was a big cost perspective. A sherry barrel is going to be significantly more expensive than a used bourbon barrel. It also ends up over time, these companies become conglomerates. And so the Scotch producer, you know, Diageo, 
owns Bullet and Dickel, and so there is a there's a flow in from from their American whiskey barrels into their own products, and so it becomes strategy over time. And now the Scotch producers and tequila makers and brewers and even winemakers, they all depend upon the bourbon barrel. In a lot of ways, they really do. It is one of the most beautiful and important stories that bourbon can ever tell. So anytime we ever talk about the sustainability of uh, barrels and whiskey, you really have to go no further than just to tell the story of a single bourbon barrel. I was at Foursquare in Barbados. And this iconic rum producer had a barrel there that was like 90 years old. And this thing, man, it was just being held together. It reminded me of that cartoon where that, uh, that Cars cartoon where that old, uh, you know, old timer car was just like held together by a bucket of bolts. This thing was just held together by its hoops, barely. But he loved, uh, Richard Seal loved the flavor coming out of, out of that barrel. So I, I don't think you can ever underestimate the life of a bourbon barrel. As long as it's getting taken care of, you know, it'll keep uh, churning out good whiskey. But that's a great question. And if you would like to be like Aaron, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the question, I'll read on the air. Until next week, cheers. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com And you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky. And you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Hey everyone, welcome to another fresh episode of Bourbon Pursuit. And it is the official podcast of Bourbon, but this is also the Bourbon Community Roundtable. And it's a big one, number 85. I think that we've been hanging out this long together is... You know, it's longer than some relationships, to be honest with you. <laughs> what? <Where did laughs> come from? I'm just saying, we've all we've all dated somebody in our lives. We're like, well, this isn't going to work out. But look at us, 85 episodes deep, and we're still liking each other. Right. It's true. 
That's true. Through thick and thin, we've, mm-hmm. we've made it. Richer and poorer. Us <laughs> being poor. <laughs> say, yeah. Has anybody gotten to the richer part yet? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'd like to test it out just to see how we do, but uh, we'll find out one day maybe. Fred, he's the only smart one. And Jordan. Fred Man, and Jordan. I wouldn't mm. go that far. Mm, same. No bourbon <laughs> brands. <laughs> yeah, but... This is going to be fun, and we got another good topic tonight. But before we get going, kick it off, just to let everybody know whose voices you're hearing. So I'm Kenny, of course, one of the hosts of Bourbon Pursuit. And then I'll turn it over to Ryan as well. Hey, I'm here and glad to be here post uh, Case of the Mondays after Bourbon Festival weekend. But uh, it was a great time. It was great showing. I'm all. It was the shot in arm I needed for bourbon. It's like seeing everybody come in. It's been a tough summer for, I think, not – for a lot of bourbon brands and tough year. So it was nice to get encouragement, everybody coming from out of town and still giving me hope that people still like it. They still like the spirit. They still like the spirit. Not they don't only like our bourbon, but they like, like our rye. Tell about That's the rye. True. Rita. Yeah. The rye Rita was a big hit. Kenny was like, no bad drink that thing. Hey. And <laughs> I wasn't that. I was just saying like, it might distract from our overall purpose and mission, but boy, was I wrong once again. Yeah, the our rye outsold the bourbon by like twenty to one <laughs> because of the wow. rye. Rita. So it's funny people are like, "I'm not a rye drinker," and then as soon as they try rye, they seem to like it. So, anyways, it's just funny what people think they like, and then when they try stuff, it was a good event. It was great. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sad I missed Burn Beyond though, Fred. That's what was awesome. Saying. Feedback was people great. People were asking for you. I doubt with that. No, it's serious. <laughs> people were, know who the hell I am. People, uh, people were saying like, hey, where's Ryan? I want to see Ryan. It's true. Well, that lady needed her grass sprayed, but it yeah. wasn't <laughs> bourbon related. <laughs> Probably had a mosquito bite or something. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And then Fred, by the way, go ahead and introduce yourself. I know everybody knows you, but how was bourbon and beyond for you, man? So I'm Fred Minnick, and uh, this is not above the char. This is an episode of the round table. And, um, Bourbon and Beyond, which I've been a part of that since the very beginning, helped put it together. And I've kind of, I, I, I've taken a, a different role. I'm not a, I'm not curating the stages or consulting with the, bur- helping the DWP with the bourbons anymore. I'm just talent, you know, and I just, and I, I can do whatever I want. And I, I did my blind bourbon live and I, it was the, it was the biggest crowd I'd ever had at a, uh, at a festival. And I think the count is that um, 1,500 to 2,000 people came to my little blind bourbon live area. Not everyone got to taste. Uh, and that's the thing is like those stages, they've got the the bulk of the people right there in the tasting. And then people are kind of around on the periphery listening. And it was um, it was awesome. It was completely gratifying. And I had... I had so many people come up to me and just tell me how much they love Burn Pursuit and how much they love us, our banter together. And they're like, you need to do more episodes of just the three of you. And I was like, you know, we hear that all the time, you know? And, um, yeah, I, I, I like that. So, so much, so much love from uh, the community out there. And, and Ryan, I'm with you, man. It, it's not that it's been, it's not, I've been doing this a long time and it, it never, it never gets old when someone tells me they read something in one of my books or something. I mean, I, I just, that keeps me going and I, I love it. So I'm so thankful for that. I wish I could have got out to the bourbon festival, but I wasn't even at bourbon and beyond the whole time. I had a, um, I had a private event with, uh, the executive team of PNC bank in Baltimore and I had to, and I didn't even get home until Friday. So, Oh, well, I do want to give a quick shout out to the bourbon festival staff, Stacy, Randy, everyone like the, for us as vendors, they were incredible. I mean, they rolled out the red carpet for everyone, making sure we had ice, making sure we needed everything. It was well done. And I just want to give a shout out to all the volunteers and staff that made it possible. The feedback was great. Y'all did great. And so thankful for that that event. Just had to throw it in there. Sorry. Well, good job. Everybody needs the kudos. And then, Blake, I don't know about you. I guess mine might have been like maybe like 10 or 15 people shy of like Fred's record crowd. But how was yours at Bourbon & Beyond? Yeah. 
I, I mean, as you can imagine, being at uh, the first one on Friday at Bourbon and Beyond, we were just a few shy of that 1,500 to 2,000 number. But <laughs> no, I got a chance to go to Kentucky Bourbon Festival on Thursday, see all y'all and hang out there, which is a lot of fun, and then hit Bourbon and Beyond on Friday, which is it's just really cool to see how massive that thing has has become. And I mean, it's been that way, but it just is it's really fun. It's, you see a, a, a great draw and it's funny. Like I got back and found out my cousin was there with her sister. Well, who, I guess they're both my cousins, but I saw one of their posts that they're at bourbon and beyond. And y- you know, they just came in and I didn't even know it. Um, but they came there for the music, but it's like, Oh, it's cool. We kind of like bourbon. So it just is cool. The audience that they both bring in where I feel like Kentucky bourbon fest, You have a lot of people who are diehard. They want to try stuff. They want to buy bottles and do all that kind of thing. Bourbon and beyond, it can be, you know, you could be a diehard, but you can also bring somebody else who's just really into music. So also I'm Blake from Sealbox. There's my intro. That's not that part. (laughs) It's like watching those movies and nowadays it's like they don't even put the title at the very beginning. It's like the closing screen was the title of the movie. Yep. That's, that's it. But, (laughs) and Jordan, go ahead, man. Good scene again. Good seeing you guys too. It's been a been a hot minute. Uh, Jordan from BreakingBourbon.com. Happy to be here. We weren't able to be down there for the weekend. We went down a little bit early that week. Eric was down there for Barrel and a few other things. But uh, hopefully next year, fellas. Yeah, we'll make it happen. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I vote we do this in person next year. I know we talked about it uh, before, but we can do something really cool. Maybe have like a, have like a live event at Watch Hill proper or something like that. Um, Speed Museum would host us. There's Maybe at our place, hopefully. No, there That's you go. The open by the How's end. the internet? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't know yet. We'll figure that out. <laughs> we don't have any electricity. <laughs> <laughs> or plumbing. All right. So this is uh, another one of those types of roundtable discussions. It kind of is a follow along to the last one that we had kind of talked about. But this one, I kind of started getting and started thinking about uh, more philosophical thinking deeper about the buying habits of a lot of bourbon drinkers. And if anybody's kind of wondering, no, I'm not sitting around and just having meditational and thought provoking things that I always have to give a shout out. I, I listen, Ryan turned me on to this a while ago of listening uh, to Seth Godin. He is a very much a, I'd say an inspirational, very deep thought kind of marketing person and understanding of like how to find the customers and the product and how do you change and adapt it to uh, the current environment and everything like that too. And this one is kind of when I looked at it because a lot of his thoughts and mentalities go of, of when you try to create a product for something, and especially in our world, you kind of think, well, we're looking for the neophyte. You're looking for the person who's always looking for something new. Who is the, what that person is always trying to find something different or unique. And I kind of thought about this because it's very, uh, I guess it's a antagonist or like on the opposite end of what we see in bourbon. Because what we see in bourbon is that I see pretty much everybody talking and chasing after the same exact thing. There's not a lot of people that are looking for different things all the time. Every single time when I'm looking around and scrolling through Facebook, a lot of the comments, a lot of the pictures, it's all the same. It's either be somebody complimenting somebody because they got themselves a bottle of Blanton's and they're saying way to go. Or there's people standing outside of a liquor store and they're waiting for stuff that had typically been on the shelves forever. Eagle Rare and for some reason, W.O. Well of Reserve Green Label, people are buying it up. And now we're getting to the point where it's not just for that one bottle, but people are now having the same exact bottle and it might be 10 deep on the shelf. And so I actually put this question to our Patreon group uh, a few weeks ago. And I kind of said, I was like, so if you see an Eagle Rare and like, what makes you want to grab it? Like you've had it plenty of times. So why do you continue to still pull it off the shelf? So instead of like thinking, oh, I'll go ahead and put my money towards something else. Well, why would I just not go? Why do I keep buying the same thing over and over again? So I'll kind of put it to you all first. And maybe this is something you can talk about your own journey is that, you know, when is it enough? Like after you've had these staples, when was it enough that you said, well, maybe I'm ready to try something new. And by the way, I want to make sure that I set the stage properly. I'm not telling you to go and pass on picking up that rare bottle of William Lerue Weller or Pappy Van Winkle or anything like that. 
please pick those up all day long. But this is kind of getting into some of the mainstays that we see that have been your typical $30 bottles, but people are just gobbling up left and right. And so when you have 10 of them on the shelf, I'm kind of curious, like, when is it enough? And and why would you keep going back and, and buying the same bottles over and over again? I mean, I'll jump in. Uh, I think it, it's just like, we've talked about a lot, but you know, that old fear missing out, you think, well, you know, I didn't see it six months ago. It wasn't there. So maybe I'll get on a, you, you know, a, a real hot streak and drink through 10 bottles of Eagle Rare in a weekend or something. And <laughs> it's a lot, that's a lot to do like, in a weekend, Blake. Yeah, I know. I, it, it is. Um, or so I'll just throw personal experience out here, out here where obviously I have a retail site that you know, we focus on craft whiskey and blenders and that kind of thing. We don't sell Eagle Rare, but if I see it, I still usually grab a bottle if it's at a good price because I know guaranteed somebody's going to come over and say, "Oh, I've never had that" or something. So I'll either give it to them or let them drink it or whatever it may be. It's just like those those go tos. You just kind of want. I don't know. You can't get enough of them. So ten bottles seems a little excessive if you're still grabbing bottles after that when you see them on the shelf. But I think there's just something in us where it's it's like there is never enough. And, you know, it, as long as you're drinking responsibly and, you, you know, not thinking, is it my mortgage or, or am I going to pay my mortgage or buy bourbon this month? You know, I think it's fine. Like, who cares if you stack 10, 12 bottles of the same thing up if that's what you like? And then you're able to trade it with friends or something else like that. So I don't think it's the worst thing that we could have in bourbon. I think it comes down to, you know, similar to what Blake said, as long as it's not a problem, there's there's a lot of folks out there who don't, for lack of a better words, want to try something new, mainly because it's the sunk cost of trying something new, right? They're afraid they're going to buy a bottle. They may not like it, then they're stuck with it. And they only do that so many times before they say, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to stick with what I know. And if I really like this and it's good, I'm just going to stock up on it. There's other people who just like, you know, stocking up to stock up and and like anything. Why do people collect football cars and then they collect 10 of the same card or, you know, collect, you name it, they collect it, right? Why do people collect cars? They have four Corvettes. Uh, they like Corvettes. There's nothing wrong with that either. I think it's the exact opposite mindset of what we have and probably everyone listening to this podcast has. We're in it to try new bourbons, try new whiskeys, try new ryes. We're always searching for the next new thing. For a lot of other consumers out there, they're the exact opposite. They're looking for that safe bet that they know is going to taste good and they're okay stocking up on it because then they're like, well, I got you know, 12, 14, 20 months worth of good bourbon on me. All right, I'll just stick with that. And um, not saying that's the right mentality, but it's not necessarily the wrong mentality either. So, Jordan, uh, real quick before, before you join in, do you think that there's a, there's a stigma or there's a thought that just people are afraid of change? And that's why it's like, you know, you, you have this one thing, you like it and you're like, well, why would I ever go back to something else? I mean, the way that you say it, it was like, well, it kind of reminds me of my wife. She won't buy a different car except a forerunner because that's all she's known. And that's all she wants to have. Yeah. Me, on the other hand, I'm always trying to figure out like what's new or what's different. It was like the same thing when I was getting into watches. I was like, I don't want a Rolex. Like everybody has a Rolex. Like I want something different. So I'm, I'm kind of curious of like the different thought process of people and maybe they're just afraid of going against the grain. Yeah, I think it's a little bit about that, right? Some people just don't, they're, they're uncomfortable with change. They know what they, they know what they like and they don't want to change. And they don't want to stick with it. Other people have been burned by change, whether it's, for example, your car analogy with uh, the forerunner or whether it, and that's a much more expensive change, or whether it's <laughs> not just they, um, they tried a few bottles of different whiskey and they're just like, oh boy, I got burned. And now they have like four or five bottles that they, every time they walk past their bar to get a sip of their favorite insert X that they have 10 bottles of, they stare at those same four or five bottles that are just ounce or two gone. They're like, I can't, you know, I don't want to pour it away. I don't want to do anything with it. What am I going to do with this? Maybe they don't have people over to share it with. And they're just like, that's their reminder right there. That's why they don't change. And um, so they find they find comfort in them what they know. Not saying, again, not saying this right or wrong. I'm right there with you, Kenny, right? I love trying new things in all aspects of life and I'll always go for something new. Then there's others that I know and probably my wife's the same way. She likes what she likes because she knows she's going to like it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that carries through to the bourbon world too. I think, you know, if you add, you know, uh, what everyone's saying is obviously very accurate, but if you add the investor mentality that we have as, um, as Americans, if you go to, if you go to school, you go to college, you, you enter 
enter the workplace, you get a 401k. I mean, a, a lot of people who are into bourbon are very investment minded. They're very, they're, they're very much into wanting to know property value of certain areas. When, when I've done tours with people, you know, they, they start asking questions about my businesses and like, Oh, I have an idea for you to make more money. And like, Oh, what's a bottle that's going to accrue in value. I, I think there's a large group of people, especially to those who watch or read uh, about bourbon that they're doing it for, you know, a college fund. I, I hear that all the time. Now, does that mean they're flipping? Not necessarily, but I'd say some of them are. And I think that's a big part of it too. But for me, I obviously, I get any whiskey I want. If I send an email to a distillery, I say, hey, I, I want to taste a sample, but I, I don't actually don't do that a lot. Stuff just comes to me. But I go to liquor stores once a month, at least, just walking around the aisle and trying to have a discovery moment. And there's one brand that I found in that discovery moment that I never would have picked up if I wasn't curious about the flavor profile. For me, it's like picking up trying to find a new flavor profile, like like buying cereal. You know, I'll add to another analogy here. We all have a cereal we like, but I also like tasting the generic cereal, see if it's as good as the the main brand. Back but to your I, cheapskate, that, you know, low <laughs> price. That's down right. Down. That's right. Uh, but I found Driftless Glen because I was just walking through Liquor Barn and boom, there it was. I was like, you know, I've heard Kenny talk about this. I need to taste it. And I haven't tasted it. They haven't sent me anything. I, I'm going to buy it. So I bought it, fell in love with them. And that that was a discovery moment for me. And not all of them go that well, mind you. Uh, I have a lot of them that uh, I gave to friends, you know, that maybe they weren't the best of friends, but I gave them the bottle. <laughs> we always got to figure out what we do with what my wife called floor whiskey. And I was oh, like, I like that. I, I was like, we got to get this off the floor and get, put it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Humans are fascinating creatures. If you just sit back and and watch them, you know, it's like. And with with bourbon or anything, it's like most people are not going to be early adopters and they'd like to be told how to think, how to dress, how to live this and that by social pressure, social norms, this and that. And like in all aspects of life, I don't know, the masses just like safe and like they like catchy and they like feeling cool. They like they like to be accepted by society. And that's. No different in bourbon. Like people go and grab these bottles because they can show them off at ha home and be like, oh, I got Weller Special Reserve or Blends or whatever. Because it's like this, it's not only the safe, but it's also the cool thing. You know, it's like they can feel accepted and that they've proven themselves to other people. And, and, and that, that's what branding and this people have a story in their head that they're telling themselves all the time about different products and how I live and how this makes me feel or makes people feel about me. And, and I think that's why people buy these bottles and you know, it's the, the, the whiskey's great. I mean, it's fine. Uh, I think that's just somebody in the chat said herd mentality. That's what it is. It's like, you know, you, you see it at the bourbon festival, somebody go try this like hot thing. And then they hear about it, they go tell other people and then everybody else is following because they want to see it. And they just like, the herd just follows the herd and it's we're all at the end of the day, it's just like animal spirits and it's, it's no different in bourbon. I'm kind of repeating myself, but it's fascinating to watch, you know, and it's, it's too, but the bourbon consumer also is at the same time, this new bourbon consumer. I don't even know if they know what bourbon is. Like I was thinking about this this weekend, like they, they haven't had the opportunity to try like really good bourbon because they haven't really been available to them. And so they've had just this onslaught of kind of young, finished, like whiskey that, and you know, when they finally do get like a blends or this or that, they're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever had because they're comparing it to all that other stuff. And it's like, so I, I just don't know that the new consumer and then so many people get it, I actually understand. They've never had like uh, an older Russell's or an older Willet or an older OGD or, you know, from the nineties or eighties, like all these fantastic whiskeys. I just don't know if new consumers have had that. So I, I, I don't know. The consumer now is just interesting to try to figure out like what the hell do they want? <laughs> I don't know. 
Well, that that's an interesting point, Ryan, because I'll have people over and you know do whatever they want to drink, right? And and just like all y'all, it's it's a huge library to choose from. And often, like, so I'll pour something different that they've never had or try something new, and then they'll be like, "Pour me something that you think I'll like that I can actually buy." Because like everything you poured has been good, but now pour me something I can actually find in the store. Because that's all you know. That's my options. That's what I'm going to go after. And so it's almost the mentality like, yeah, I'd love to try something new, and it's great, but like I'm never going to be able to find it. So just show me like what my availability is and what can I, sure you know, what can I actually try. And and that's kind of sad. Like when you hear people say that, it's like, oh yeah, okay, sure. That yep, here we go. So it's um it's almost you know they're boxing in their palate just based on what's available to them because they don't want to pay more than MSRP and they know their reality and they just want to be able to walk into a store and not wait in line and stuff like that. And um, it puts them in a tough spot. It puts them in a tough spot just as much as it produ- puts producers in a tough spot too. It's a no win for anyone at that point. Sure. Totally. Who's to blame? Are we to blame? I'd say <laughs> we're partly to yes. blame. Yeah, I mean, but- I'm seeing a lot of Henry McKenna dropped in the, uh, in the chat. Yeah. I but- have no idea who's to blame for that one. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I'd say, you know, you're only, I think that a lot of these, those were, you know, that's also like a, a something that was probably coming at some point or another, right? There's, there's no way that a 10 year old bottle and bond for $30 doesn't sit in the market and not get discovered and blow up, especially in the, the, the days of what we, we now see. Um, there's but just who's no to way. Say, to, I mean, here's the alternative to that Kenny, who's to say that heaven Hill wasn't about to repackage it and make it more expensive. Like they did old Fitzgerald. I mean, I, I think I think Henry McKenna's success, uh, while it was while it was okay, I think them winning that kept it in that kind of package it was in. They haven't had to change the package. They've changed the price though. That right? that's what I mean. That's what I mean. It's like it was not a brand that was it wasn't like Weller. You know, it was not it was not something that was selling a lot of. And so when it when it won World's Best won when it won Best Bourbon and then World's Best Whiskey, you know, they had they had it. They didn't have to, you know, create a new look for it to be sexy. So I don't know. I don't I don't know if that brand was was actually successful in comparison to the rest of the the Buffalo Trace stuff like that. When it won that, I mean, it became it leapfrogged a lot of the Buffalo Trace. It's getting coming back down a little bit. But anyway, my point my point to that is, is like I. I don't know if that brand was was going to get discovered unless it won something major. But the, the other side, the other side of that is, uh, did you see what it won in the 2023 San Francisco Spirit Competition? You know what it got? Silver. Silver. <laughs> yeah. Right. It didn't even double gold. And right. so you see that and you kind of think like, oh, wow, like, why does it still get this much praise because of something it won a long time ago? But I'm, I'm going to try to take it away. And I think yeah. we're getting a little bit off the, the rails here um, because I mean, I don't know if anybody's going out and buying, and this is a little bit different. I mean, at least with Henry McKenna, if you're buying a bunch of them, at least they're all single barrels, right? They are going to be a little bit different versus something. If you get 10 bottles of Eagle rare, well, they're probably going to be pretty damn close to one another. And so that's when I kind of look at it and it's, it's like, is this, and Ryan brought up a great thing. And I think he said it without actually saying it is that are people just chasing status? And that's really what it comes down to. Like, is is a bottle of Eagle Rare and a bottle of Blands and a bottle of Weller Special Reserve, like, is that status? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. 
and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Are people just chasing status? And that's really what it comes down to. Like, is, is a bottle of Eagle Rare and a bottle of Blands and a bottle of Weller Special Reserve, like, is that status? And the fact that you can take it off the shelf to make sure that you have it and somebody else doesn't, does that increase your status? I think yes and no. I mean, you know, we could do that with a, a bunch of different bottles, you know, it, with our group and our, is it like having, you know, the Willet Purple Tops at your house? Is that kind of the status? So, so I think that, that bottle changes for everybody. But I, I think with just the amount of people who are are coming into bourbon and whiskey, you're just going to have them exposed to, you know, new and different bottles that we think is like ordinary every day because they were back in the day. I mean, I was talking to a guy yesterday who he was like, yeah, I've got several hundred bottles and he comes in to to my office where I have all my bottles. He's, and I just have a bunch of old Weller 12s because they're 35 bucks back in the day and I bought a ton of them. And he's like, man, I've never actually tried this. I've never even seen a bottle in person. And in my mind, I'm like, you've been in this five years and you have hundreds of bottles. Like, how is that possible? But just because of the state he's in, it's it's not available and bars aren't getting it. So, you know, I think I think it's kind of a shifting grade and judgment call for where somebody is geographically in the country and where they are in their bourbon journey. But I'm going to try to show off every bottles of seal box that I have because I think that should be the new status. <laughs> I need verticals of seal box. We're right there so, with you, Blake. So we're not far off. I mean, and, and by the way, I, I also want to put it out there because people kind of flamed us last time. They're like, you're only saying this because you have a brand. I get it. This is this is not because we're trying to sit there and push our stuff. I'm just under trying to understand the mind of the consumer and the mind of where we are versus our listeners versus some of what we would call just the general population too. So here here's a good way to determine whether or not uh, this is chasing status. Uh, are people chasing four rows of single barrel? Are they are they giving that same treatment to Eagle Rare? Are they, are they giving the same treatment to four rows of single barrel that they are to Eagle Rare? Uh, not if it's not so. a pick. Are they giving are they giving the same treatment to a wild turkey limited edition product as they are Eagle Rare? I'd say it's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, people are lining up for, for both of those products. And if your name is Brian, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah. my my point to that is is that there are some brands that have developed that that FOMO. Michter's has created it, but Buffalo Trace wrote the book on it. And but, but I, what's wild about Buffalo Trace is that they've created the FOMO with their flagships. Like Michter's doesn't do that with their flagships. They only do it with their ten years. They're yet, you know, that's the wild yeah. thing. But did they create it, or did they just kind of fall into it a little bit of the trickle down of Pappy and everything else? I think they created. I think. I do think they were masterminds at the the allocation game and they really understand where there's the line of having too much versus too little, you know, whereas I think some other brands probably push the line of having too much, you know, out there and it devalues the brand, you know, probably Elijah Craig, you know, being one of those, like, you know, it's, I think Elijah Craig is just as good, if not better than any of the, in Russell's 10, same thing, you know, Without as, a uh, doubt. Without as a doubt. Uh, any of the, the Sazerac products. But if you're, uh, let's, let's put a, a retailer hat on. I mean, Blake, all right, you have an opportunity, uh, to carry 10, um, 10 barrel picks of Blanton's Eagle rare stag, whatever. Are you taking that? Or are you taking 10 barrel picks of four roses and wild Turkey? Which one's going to sell better? Yeah, I mean it's it's going to be the Sazerac products all day. 
you know, I, I would like to counter it and be like, well, I'll do five and five or, you know, cause I like drinking <laughs> this, but y- y- if you're looking at it a, purely from demand standpoint and dollars for dollar standpoint, the, the Bland's barrel is just going to move at lightning pace. And, you know, I, I see some, I'm starting to see it more often now, some retailers locally in Jacksonville have some good barrel picks of Four Roses pop up, have a good Russell's pick pop up. And, um, you know, you don't see that uh, with with Blanton's or even really Eagle Rare. Okay, so to try to bring this back a little bit, because I feel like we're we're getting into the the allocation, the FOMO and everything like that. And, and I kind of want to think about, back to your all's, thoughts of like well when was it enough like when was it enough for you all that you saw a bottle of eagle rare on the shelf you just left it you're like i I don't need this anymore or blands or whatever because for me it's been years probably because i haven't seen it but still now i don't even get it and i just i've seen some people in the chat they're like well i'll get it because maybe i'll have a friend come over and get it well are you doing that or are you getting it because you're like well i i've got to get it i know that it's allocated it's it's rare i I have to have it and you know maybe i'll give it to somebody and maybe that's just what i tell myself to feel better even though i'm I'm not actually going to do it it's uh uh, i'll talk about that really quick so i still will say like blanton's or elmer which you haven't seen him forever no one talks about or anything like that i'll still pick up a bottle even though i have a few here for myself but it's always not for me we get a ton of bourbon sent to us right We're, we're very fortunate i buy a ton of bourbon every single month and a lot of it i give away to friends and I have a laundry list of people who are always asking me, hey, can you help me out with this? Can you help me out with that? And I am the first person to be like, yep, sure can. Let me buy something and do good for someone else. So you know, I like to think other people are out there doing the same thing for their friends or their family. I know in reality, a lot of people are just stocking for themselves, hoping something good comes up for them later on that they can either trade or sell or do something with. But um, I still think there's that mentality out there like, hey, I'm going to help somebody else out. If it's there and I see it, let's help someone else out with it. I ain't going to lie. If I if I'm walking through a liquor store and I this has happened in the last six months, I see I see Blanton's or I see Eagle Rare, and it's with if it's our SRP, I'll, I'll I'll likely buy it. And I hate to say this, but if I see Henry McKenna too, uh, I I will buy it, and I have, and I've even posted some pictures on Instagram about it. But I will buy it, and well, let's yes, go, let's go deeper. I buy it for me. Why? Uh, well, for the Blantons, uh, I give to, I do give to a friend or I keep it around as a gift. I don't drink it. Um, if it's Booker's, it's because it's demanded by my wife. If it's, uh, uh, if it's Eagle Rare, I actually like Eagle Rare. So I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna apologize for that. It's, it's good whiskey. And I don't, I don't have that in the house very often. And I, I don't always want to drink cash drink. Sometimes I want something, you know, that's lower in proof. So I think, I think Eagle rare is, um, it's, it's availability. Let's, t- let's take that out of the conversation for a minute. I mean, you know, you got Eagle rare, you've got Elijah Craig, you got wild turkey one oh one, you got Rowan's Creek. You've got, uh, you know, it, a handful of others. But there's a lot of the good bourbon out there it's getting higher and higher in proof. And sometimes I just don't want that. And that's why. And I will drink that. And I don't need to defend myself on Henry McKenna. You all know why I'm buying <laughs> that one. But um, so, yeah, I, I do. But it, it's got to be within reason. I mean, I'm not paying 200 bucks for it. It's got to be, you know, something reasonable there. But it, it depends on the brand. I'll buy. I'll still buy a Four Roses single barrel over it. That's just me. Me personally, I think you get to a point that you realize it's don't get me wrong. It's 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 great whiskey. It, it's fine. I think there for me personally, I just think there's so much better out there and you can try more different things. And and it, but that's just my mindset. I'm I'm always like if people think it's popular, then I think it sucks. And that's probably, a you know, I, that's just the way I think about things. I, I just don't like being part of the herd. I like to be thinking differently. And, and that's the story I tell myself is that I'm different, you know, and whether that's, you know, I'm just as a tribal as anyone else. That's my story is I'm different and I don't want to be the same. And that's when it became enough for me is it used to be nobody drank well or 12. I would go to Rite Aid and get liters of it for $30. Like it was nothing. And it was because I knew about it and no one else did. But as soon as people started knowing about it, I was like, I don't really care anymore. You know, it's, that's, that's just, me personally, my journey. 
in my mindset. What about you, Blake? Did you have to open that vault and go the same thing that Jeb had here on the chat that says, when I look at it and I go, I've got so many damn bottles, I don't need anything more of this. Yeah, I mean, I would say I would say that's the case, but I'm kind of like Fred where I've been in a store in the last few months and and still picked up a bottle here and there. So it's uh it's hard to say. I I will say that once uh, I've seen this happen multiple times, especially on barrel picks where and even some of my own, it's like if I have four or five open of different picks of the same brand, it's like, okay, how many do you need? And that that's kind of my number. If if I can fill up a a six pack of that bottle it's probably time to to grab something different um which is the fun in it anyways i mean i think we we referenced this earlier but in general we all like trying different stuff and and putting new bottles in our collection and so i'd say that's my loose rule it's it's not steadfast but anything six above or anything above six bottles is just that's excess at that point you know that's (laughs) you've got a problem if you're buying more than that so (laughs) So I guess the the moral of the story here is that as much as we all want to try something new, we all have that that sort of thing in the back of our mind that goes, well, at least this is safe. Like, I know what I'm getting here. I know I'm not going to get burned and I don't have to go spend my money on something new or trying new things or anything like that. Is that is that what we're kind of getting at here? I think so. Yeah, I think that's yeah. fair. Yeah. I'm with Fred too. Henry McKenna, I will buy that one. And just because Heaven Hill has a deep place in my heart, but. I'm like with Eric Carrico. If I see Knob Creek store picks, I always get those because those are, they're not only good, but they're, they make great cocktails too. Mm. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it. We, we, we could, we could have a go to from every one of the distilleries and we, and we probably have bought all of those things within the past year. And in the past year, I've probably bought three Buffalo Trace products because, and, and I'm not talking about just my, not just my, you know, for home use, you remember I do tastings like all over the country. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm going through a a venue and I say, Hey, I would like to have Eagle rare there. They like laugh at me. Like they have, they haven't seen Eagle rare and somewhere like Minneapolis in like six months for a, uh, you know, for a restaurant. So it's like, I don't even ask for Eagle. I don't even ask for that shit anymore because I don't want to, get laughed at by the restaurant tour or something, but, or the hotel, but it's like, you know, that issue is a burden on us as consumers and it's a, it's going to hurt them. It's going to really, really, really hurt them down the road. And if, and if, and I know we always end up talking about Buffalo trace allocation issues, but man, if, if, if they don't do a better job and get it figured out, it's going to, it's going to bite them in the ass 10 years when things start going South. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at it and you think, well, you want to make sure that you satisfy. You want to make sure that everybody that you want to be as a customer, you want to give them a good experience. And it amazes me that most people end up pissed off, but they still go and chase it. They still go and look for it. They still go and wait in line. And there'll be, you know, there'll be like five people at the end, like, ah, oh, I didn't get the bottle I wanted. Like, oh, and they're, but they're like, well, I'll try again next week. Right. It's, it's and because most- people feel like it's the best thing. And like, even, you know, I'll do these like tasting events for like high level executives. And, you know, the event coordinator is like, we have to have Pappy. I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's not as good as you think it is. She's like, it doesn't matter uh, what you think of it. It's like these CEOs, they want Pappy there. And then they take, they all will taste it. And they'll like, I mean, in my last tasting, they like smoke wagon uncut over Pappy. And it was given the option to buy the two, they'll pick the baby. Exactly. Every time, every time. But I saw it this weekend. It it, even people try and are just our rye whiskey. It's like they need permission from someone to tell them rye whiskey is okay. Even though they think it, and I'm not just saying us, it's just, it's like that with any product. Like they will personally like something better, but won't buy it because they don't think they'll be accepted as a consumer if they buy that. Even though they like that, it doesn't, it's a fascinating yeah, yeah, thing. It doesn't yeah. uh, fit the definition of how they see themselves. You know, there's a deep, deeper psychological thing we have going on here. That's what I'm trying to get at, right? I'm trying to figure out how deep can we go to figure out what's the root of all this. 
Do we know any psychologists we could bring in for the next round? Actually, Ooh, actually we, we have one. Yeah, your wife. We have one lined <laughs> up for the podcast. We have, we're going to interview him in January, right, Kenny? Yes. Yeah, we got we got somebody kind of lined up for that. Um, and then kind of like one question as we sort of tail off and, and kind of look into this as well is that we had talked about the whiskey and the ones that we look at uh, that for some reason we keep waiting, we keep buying for some odd reason, even though that we we feel like we're we feel that we're early adopters. We feel that we're the neophytes. We feel that we're the ones trying to find something new and change. Yet there's still something inside of us that says like, well, you know, Booker's is still Booker's. It's good stuff. Uh, and they're really wrong. There's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Booker's is still great. And everything that we talked about, it's still great whiskey. Listen, I'm just kind of curious. Shit on Booker's, my I'm wife not might talking just, shit on Booker's. She might Booker's. appear out of nowhere. And all I'm ass. saying is like, I don't need 10 bottles of Booker's. That's, that's all I'm saying. Right. I was just, that's the point is like, at what point do you need enough of it? But this is my follow on to it is that at what point have you all experienced your taste change? over the past few years and you go, you know what? I'm not a really much a fan of this as I thought I was. And now I've got a cute couple bottles sitting around. Yeah, definitely barrel proof offerings. I'm not as keen on as I used to be. It's, I mean, I'll like them, but they're just, I, whereas they used to be just like all about it. It's like the higher the proof, the better, you know? And then now it's just like, I want something balanced, something that has uh, good flavors, but doesn't blow my, socks off maybe i'm just getting older and whatnot but because i used to just love barrel proof everything but well that's because that's where the best whiskey used to go but as as the trend for barrel proof uh grew people started dumping in shitty whiskey and so i don't think it's that you don't like barrel proof i just think you're having to taste a lot of shitty products yeah. and what's getting watered down to be 90 proof or 80 you know and so and you, it, it, those unwanted flavors are not as uh common and when you water it down, but, um, what was the question, Kenny? How's your palate changed, I guess, over years or if you flavors change for you that you prefer versus you used to. Yeah, I would say for me, I've, I have found myself and I taste spirits and all, all spirits. I mean, I know, I know I'm for, I'm known for bourbon, but I spend a shit ton of time and, and rum. I love tequila. I'm everywhere, but vodka. And I found like, I don't like, gin like i used to um so that's been something that that has kind of caught me off guard in the in the past year because i used to really love gin and i find myself looking more for spicier notes versus like uh you know care and i think it's because with with spicy spice forward you know bourbons there's there's still sweetness there but i have found like those caramel bombs which which i love they don't do as well in blind tastings um, if they don't have a little bit of spice backbone to them. If there's not a, if there's not another element, if it's just caramel forward. So I think I think I'm always on that hunt for a very complex bourbon as it is. And you know, if you got sweet and spice, that's that's the money for me. I agree, Fred. I think for me, it's been it almost ties back to the beginning of this conversation, right? Because we get to taste so many different bourbons, and I do, I really, really enjoy just a good, well-rounded classic bourbon or a classic rye, back to the basics. But because we try so much bourbon, I like my palate is just seeking. It's like addicted to the next new thing. Like what's different out there? Like what's out there that I haven't tried before that's going to bring a new flavor profile, whether it's a different barrel finish, different type of wood used, did they age it someplace else, different grain, different anything. It's like addicted to the rush of finding a new flavor profile profile that you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And then it just, all right, two weeks later, what, what's next? What else is out there, right? And that's, again, not going, I really appreciate a well-crafted, just classic bourbon, right? Or classic rye. But that's, that's interesting because when I first started off, I didn't want anything that deviated outside the norm. I wanted just your classic flavor profile. That's all I wanted. Anything else was, ah, this just doesn't taste like a bourbon. It doesn't taste like a rye. And, um, you know, now it's because, because we've been exposed to so many different whiskeys out there and there's so much good stuff on the market, which is really for all you listening, no problem stock up on your favorite bottle, but make sure you're varying, you know, what your palate gets to taste because there's some really great stuff out there, but it is addicting. I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. Your credit card will thank you later. Eh, something like that. You'll get the points. For mine, I hate to just piggyback off of Ryan's, but there's something about the higher proof that I think just the more going through barrel tastings and barrel samplings and been drinking a lot more tequila and wine recently where, you know, you pull out a lot of flavor at lower proof. And I really do think there's 
like Fred said, there's something about something becomes popular and now everybody's like, oh, we have to do it. And it's like, well, not all whiskey or not all bourbon is made to be drunk at barrel strength just because it doesn't all drink fantastic at, at one thirty. But you, you know, as a classic Booker's lover and Elijah Craig barrel strength lover, and especially George C. Stagg, that's always been my go-to. It's like, I don't need some random, you know, source from Indiana that's five years old at barrel strength always like it at times, but they're not all made the same, which is, is very interesting to see. And I feel like I've had that a lot recently where it's like, man, I'd, I'd hate to proof this down, but it almost needs it. Um, and then as soon as that happens, I know the comments are going to be like, ah, it's fine. But at 120, I wish they left it at cast strength. You know, it's, uh, we, we just are, we're inclined to think more expensive means better, higher proof means better, higher age statement means better. And, uh, that's, that's not the case. Yeah. It's just like those old Forrester, like barrel proofs, old Forrester is perfectly proofed at a hundred. I mean, the, every barrel pick we've done at a hundred is far superior in flavor than any barrel proof one we've done, I think. And the ones we've tried to. Yeah. And I'll kind of wrap it up. And I know I've talked about it on the show before is that my taste definitely changed over the years. I've got, I think, back to the hoarding mentality, I probably got five or six bottles of raised wheat, one liter w- W12s, and I can't drink them anymore. I don't really think they're that good. Um, I don't know why, but I've got one on the bar and it's probably been sitting still this full since 2015. I'm just not a fan of it anymore. And I don't know why. I don't know if it, the whiskey's changed or if I've changed or anything like that. But that was actually something that, uh, shout out to Justin who put it in the chat. And he was like, "Does is your taste a change or do you think the product's changed over the years? And there's definitely something to that because of the way that whiskey stocks have gotten a little bit lower in age. Uh, that can go back to uh, Fred screaming at the top of his lungs when they took Elijah Craig 12 year off the the front of the label. But, you know, this is just something that we have seen uh, just the whiskey atmosphere and, and culture has, has definitely shifted over time. But I think everybody's tastes do change. And I think the only thing we can say is that to keep your mind open. And when you're sitting there, Ryan and Blake, you're sitting there talking about lower proof. I see people in the chat talking about the, the latest uh, Pursuit Series pick that you did, which was a barrel proof at 89 proof, right? And people are eating it up right there too. Yeah, Fred, have you ever seen that before? Nobody has ever. I had a we had a barrel of rye entry proof 120 mm-hmm. that dropped to 89 proof. Yeah, wild years. turkey, <laughs> wild turkey has that. They have a lot of those. If the, like dirt floors, the proof will go down. So they had a product. They had a master's key product a few years ago. It was called. Uh, it was a cast strength, and I think it was at 86.8, something like that. So yeah, it's wild. Yeah, well, that was the old, that was like the first 17 year one. That that may have been the first Master's Keep in general, I think. Might have been. Uh, that was a good one. I love it. was good. Yeah. Yeah, that was tasty. All right, fellas. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this one. Again, thank you so much for going deep with me. And I'm going to kind of go back to the, the drawing board and kind of think what other kind of deep thoughts can we get for the next round table? We'll do, we'll maybe do like three or four of them, then we'll switch back into doing our kind of rapid fire yeah, I three think topics. We need to do the, the, is the everyday pour going? I actually have that one queued up. Maybe for the next time it says, why do we even have a daily drinker anymore? Or the daily drinker. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and queue that up for next time. But let's go ahead and wrap this one up. So Jordan, I'll let you kind of go first. Yeah, as always, great being here, fellas. Jordan from BreakingBourbon.com. Always enjoy these conversations. Thanks for everyone joining on the chat too. Some really good conversations. Yeah. And our good friend, Blake, Sealbox, Bourboner. Brother. Brother. Okay. By the way, Blake, real quick. Uh, I was actually talking to one of my old college friends on the phone about 30 minutes before we came on here. And he was like, where can I get your bottles? And I was like, it's on this site called Sealbox. You can ship, they can ship to Florida or whatever. And, and he was like, are you on the about us page? And I was <laughs> like, no, no, that's, that's the, that's the guy that actually owns a thing. So <laughs> I definitely had that at KBF as well. Somebody walked up and they're like, um, they said something about, you know, love your whiskey. I'm like, oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. You know, we try to make things kind of funky. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, how you're blending it from three states. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, that's that's <laughs> the guy over there. Like, <laughs> uh, it happens. But yes, I am Blake from Sealbox. So thanks for having me again. This was a fun one. And just remember, you can drink whatever you want. You can collect a thousand bottles of the same thing or 
just spread it around. Um, I think it'd be more fun to spread it around, but always fun to be here and enjoyed it. Thank you. For sure. Well, fellas, again, thank you so much. This has been a fun, interesting roundtable, another good topic. And we'll be able to see everybody here in a few weeks, or should I say about a month from now, as we go for another one. But until then, make sure you subscribe to the show. Tell all the friends, tell your other whiskey loving friends, the people that you think like, why are you, are you still waiting in line for bottles here? Go listen to these guys. I think they're going to give you some good recommendations. You can go and watch Fred's YouTube channel where he's always reviewing something. The guys from Breaking are always putting something out. And of course, Blake's always releasing a ton of stuff that even if it's Amber on a finish, we still love them. But until next week, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Fuck sucks. Doodles. Doodles.